it is a serious and a very significant change in the the way one appraises um, international law to see the emergence of the human, the human subject as a worthy subject of protection, a worthy figure of um, shielding from the, shall we say, the depravities of power and whatnot. However, we are left with this very strange problem. The greatest protectors are the same as also the greatest violators. The states are the ones who are meant to, are the protectors. They have to be the enforcers and they have to be the ones who sign up to the conventions. They need to be the observers. And then also, ironically enough, they're the ones who are some of the gravest abusers. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies. And today I'm talking to Dr. Binoy Kampmark, who is a senior lecturer in the School of Global, Urban and Social Studies at Australia's RMIT University, where he researches the interconnection of law, international relations and history. In one of his projects, he traces the evolution of the rogue state discourse in American political debate. And since recently we are seeing this re-emergence of the idea of an axis of evil, um, I thought this is the perfect time to talk to him about how the US approaches this labeling of its adversaries and what that means socially and legally. So, Binoy, welcome. It's a pleasure being here. Uh, Binoy, I found you through a common friend in the Multipolar Peace Alliance, uh, Warwick Powell, and uh, I saw on your profile that you're studying, doing, you're doing this very interesting research on, on the legal aspects of relabeling countries in a certain way. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. Uh, well, one of the interesting things that I found, and this, this goes back to my doctoral research as well, it's the idea of, um, of course, giving nation states, uh, personalities and moral characters, characteristics, as it were, anthropomorphizing them uh, in a rather sort of an interesting way. And I, I found that really fascinating. And so one of the things that struck me uh, in the aftermath of the attacks of, you know, 9-11, you know, on the Twin Towers, the Pentagon and so on. So, you know, in 2001, one of the things that struck me as interesting was the language used, for example, by the speechwriter for George W. Bush, uh, the axis of evil being used in that context uh, with uh, slight adjustments and whatnot. And it struck me as being a very curious way of looking at, at, at states. Um, and then what I thought was this could be an interesting project. So I went back and had a look at the origins of not necessarily the word rogue state or anything, but the word rogue state can also be seen in different uh, forms. And the idea of the outlaw state can be found as back as early as, for example, in the, you know, um, during the debates and the arguments, certainly in the United States, parts of European debates and whatnot, in the First World War where there was this notion about, uh, you know, uh, Willem in Germany, Kaiserism, the idea that this could be a, also a criminal state. And that's really what struck me. So I ended up looking at that period between the outbreak, as it were, during the course of the First World War, and then to the Nuremberg trials, uh, culminating, you know, in 1946. And it struck me that it was such a fascinating argument uh, some many, many times a bit misplaced, but it featured in this long notion about how you demonize states, how you identify criminal components of a state, and how do you identify who is responsible for what when it comes to international law. So that's really what interested me. Yeah, and this is fascinating because it goes hand in hand with the evo evolution of international law, right? And the idea mm. that was born after the First World War that we outlaw war altogether, right? Until the First World War, it was war was a prerogative of the state, right? It wasn't mm. illegal. That's why we have the law of war and 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 the idea of war crimes that that then evolved over time, but they, they used to, to pertain to illegal acts inside war, not war itself. And then you're saying that the discourse so about rogue states 
kind of goes goes in that direction with but 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 not not on an international codified in an international codified way right because this is purely jargon inside the united states like uh, discourse <laughs> the the united states uh, is very interesting because they they are the ones when i say they they being the obviously the the legal representatives and the the figures associated with uh, that particular line of reasoning uh, that come up with many of the draftings that are connected with, for example, the law of the sea, uh, the International Criminal Court, but they're the, also the last ones to sign up to them. So there's a very odd kind of paradox with the United States where they produce some of the most significant legal documents at the drafting stage, but the politics of it then changes because the Senate will never approve those things. Uh, so the United States, for example, uh, to this day is, I think, if I'm not mistaken, one of two countries that has not formally ratified and signed on to the Convention of the Rights of the Child, um, which is extraordinary because virtually everybody else has. And, and it, is, it is one of those really fascinating things. And I think, it, it, you know, to get back to that fundamental point, jargon is fundamental. And I think during the, you mentioned the issue of outlawing war, that's is a really significant point. Because the outlawing of war, I would argue, is the fundamental point, the tilt, as it were, about moralizing state behavior. Because when that debate took place uh, that resulted in the kellogg Briand Pact in 1928, and we were talking about 60 plus signatories at the time, it created this notion about not, you know, you renounce war as a mechanism of resolving disputes. So there was the argument that this was a, a normative, a formative norm in international law. And guess where we see that appearing? We see that appearing in the Nuremberg trials. And we see the allies drafting it as part of the prosecution against Nazi Germany as a fundamental feature of that. To a lesser extent, it's less convincing in the Japanese context, the international tribunal of the Far East, but in the German context, it was it's really interesting because many lawyers, uh, United States, also in the UK, argued that this is a very dangerous thing to do. So it's a very dangerous thing to argue that when it comes down to the notion of international law and war, it's dangerous to make the point that, OK, you're criminalizing a conduct that has been accepted for millennia. Yeah. And, the, and so in that particular case, it was really interesting how that factored into the Kellogg-Briand Pact. The thing that then appeared also in the in, in the trials in 1946, be it in the Far East or be it in, in Germany, is of course the question of uh, applying law retroactively, because oh, yes. that was the first time this happened. And OK, that's just done a done deal, right? You then you you you. Um, the idea that that the lawyers at the time also uh, accepted, or that was that the judges argued, is that these were mm. crimes that are so heinous that the, the the people perpetrating them must have understood that it was uh, criminal, and therefore, therefore, it's it's valid. Um, what do you then make out of out of this the argument as it goes forward that? Now we have we live in a world where the, the United States designates other states that are per se, like as a state, <laughs> um, rogues. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Um, so, so first, uh, so in terms of the first part, this is a classic method about how you identify what is supposedly meant to be a normal custom in international law. The usual assumption in international law is that there's a practice that has been ongoing and accepted by states for a period of time. And uh, if there's no departure from that, then it's deemed essentially to be part of practice. It's called the, uh, um, you know, not, not to bore your listeners, but it's called the Lotus Presumption. So essentially, it's from a case from the 1920s dealing with the, the sinking of a, of a French vessel and whether there was liability of the French captain or the Turkish authorities and so on. But the point about the presumption is that, generally speaking, states are entitled to do anything they want within a certain remit, um, you know, unless it's in violation of what is deemed to be custom. Um, so states can essentially do what they want. Yeah. But what and is interesting about the emergence, just, just say the emergence of a custom, though, um, 
is then seen often retrospectively because we don't know it was a custom at the time, then lawyers will then say afterwards, oh, it was a custom at the time, but just no one said it. <laughs> it is the idea also of peremptory norms, right? Uh, yes, or that's use right. Kogan's right. that that overwrites even even state uh, state to state exactly. agreements. That's right, uh, exactly. And I think in, 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 and what happened at Nuremberg uh, in the prosecution case was that and you know, the German lawyers made the argument that this is silly. I mean, this is this exactly it's it's retro, you know, retroactive, retrospective. Uh, you know, we've all been waging wars. There's no there's no concept as a you know the the idea of aggressive um, war is a tautology. Uh, crime against peace is a nonsense. But then, what was said in response and what was accepted in the international military tribunal was that they had been um, over the course of conduct um, it, we connected with the Paris Pact, the Kilobriand Pact. There was a course of conduct that suggested that war would be renounced. Now, of course, this is in a sense a bit of nonsense because wars were happening all over the place at the same time, inflicted by no less than the Soviet Union that was itself a member of the military tribunal. The attack on Finland, for example, um, you know, prior to the outbreak of the of the Second World War, and so on. Uh, the participation of the Soviet Union in the attack on Poland, and so on. But But it was, this is the classic method that is used to justify the crystallization of a principle in international law. Um, it was done in the, um, uh, the case of child recruitment of soldiers in the tribunal in Sierra Leone, or the Norman Hinga case, which features the idea that, and, and the argument made in that particular case was, well, actually, you know, when it comes down to it, when child recruitment was supposedly meant to be criminalized, it wasn't. But the argument made there was that actually by the time the recruitment was taking place in the 90s of you know children for, for armies and whatnot, there had been a development of a custom that prohibited it because of the, the Rights Convention for Children, a number of you know the ICCPR, the International Covenant, Civil and Political Rights, and so on. So It's, it's a technique that lawyers use to justify what was supposedly meant to be, but not necessarily, because it doesn't need to explicitly be mentioned for it to be a custom. <laughs> lawyering, lawyer, lawyering your way to, to where you want the case to be. Now, <laughs> That's right. But it, I mean, it is an important thing, right, that you then develop norms. And I think, I mean, looking back at 1946, yeah. yes, the argument that this was Victor's justice is a strong mm. one, but we wouldn't want to rehabilitate Nazi Germany in the sense and say like, oh, no, you oh. were treated unfairly. I mean, that's not the point. The, the sure. issue is what does this do to norm development? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, 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 you're absolutely right. I, I mean... There is an argument, um, you know, to be made that every time uh, it's a great paradox that you break laws in order to create new ones. So the argument is that, in a strange way, a departure from a state of understanding in affairs is a violation of that order. But then you create something new in, in response to that, um, and it is a very big thing in, in terms of this context. The um, The, the Indian judge in the International Tribunal for the Far East, uh, Rabi Danothpal, actually did. Um, he was the only judge to acquit Japan of all charges. True. The only judge. And he made it very clear that the issue of crime of aggression was nonsense. And he also said that how dare, essentially, Western powers tell an Eastern power, or an Asiatic power, or an Asian power, that they should be criminalized for waging conflict that they themselves had been doing with impunity for years. So it, 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 it's a remarkable judgment. It goes for 900 pages, actually. So if your listeners are interested in wanting to delve into it, it is really interesting. Um, and he's the only one, uh, I think he's the only judge that I can think of that's that has a special plaque for the martyrs uh, shrine, um, you know, for... Uh, Japanese, uh, the Japanese war criminals that we know to be um, actually in Japan. It's really quite interesting. So yeah, that just is a demonstration of how this works. 
continue. Yes, my apologies about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no problem. We are back, and we were just talking about the this evolution of of norm building, right? So the, the, the what does this do then? Like when states like the U.S., very powerful states, start to designate like unilaterally other states as mm. something, axis of evil. Uh, um, the the sorry, what was the term that we talked about? The um, rogue, rogue states, yeah, rogue and, and outlaw and, and these kind of and things. terrorist exactly. states. Because you know the problem for international law is that we have a very long development of of the law of war, actually trying to protect categories of people. Right, that's very important. I mean, prisoner yeah. of war Absolutely. is yeah. a good designation. If you are in a war and you end up captured, you would like to be a prisoner of war because you enjoy very special privileges. You are protected. You cannot mm. be just summarily executed. Uh, you have to be released least once the once the conflict is over um you have to be given adequate food and and so on all of this is 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 codified in the geneva conventions right and um then if you but if you then change the jargon if you just suddenly say this other person is not a combatant the other person is a terrorist mm. then the terrorist doesn't <laughs> enjoy the 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 rights that come with being a combatant in an international conflict so and we we are seeing that how especially Israel Israel doesn't doesn't recognize Hamas as a combatant they 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 look at them as terrorists and and mm. and they 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 take the right to shoot everyone that they suspect of terrorism right no no prisoner no no prisoner taking this is a horrible crime but they justify it by saying that um, these are not uh, combatants these are terrorists period um, so they don't get the 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 to enjoy the the, the law the the right of the, the the law of war um mm. it does mm. something similar happen when when states use these new designations like rogue states on others oh totally totally because uh, it's precisely on that basis of relabeling that it gives a latitude to approach matters in a certain way so a classic example to go back to what you just said about israel's attitude to hamas uh, the attitude can be seen in the memoranda uh, that were written um, a, a number of documents um, and they've been produced, actually, they've been put together in, in an edited collection um, uh, during the course of the, the so-called global war on terror, uh, which was a very odd term in, in of itself that was declared, of course, by, by uh, President George W. Bush. Um, and the idea of these memoranda was to justify essentially the use of waterboarding, to justify the use of torture, to justify the use of various human rights abuses, essentially, because these people were, and the category is very bizarre, the notion of an illegal combatant. I mean, you know, this is a very odd sort of thing. I mean, you're a combatant or you're not, uh, whether you wear this or that. But uh, the argument was that they don't fall within the standard categories. So the Taliban, for example, were deemed a separate category, uh, not acknowledged as a lawful entity deserving of protections of the Geneva Conventions. And therefore, um, these individuals could be rendered, they could be um, sent to these so-called black ops sites, they could be sent to Guantanamo Bay uh, and infamously tortured the way they were. It's an extraordinary thing because the it, it's precisely one of those things of uh, you know, alleviating one's responsibility for the laws of war by simply picking another label and using the moral element about, well, these people obviously have different standards Therefore, we should apply different standards to them. The same thing, you know, about justifications broadly about torture to begin with. I mean, there's some extraordinary, it's very hard to even believe that articles like this were sort of dealing with the context of, you know, that, that torture could even be justifiable in any sense. So what would happen is you redefine torture. You call it enhanced interrogation. Um, waterboarding becomes a, um, an annex of uh, enhanced interrogation. It's not really torture because the person's not really drowning. Well, of course, the person is essentially being simulated as drowning and more than that. So methods, this kind of lexical control is very fundamental in this tactical approach, if you like, which produces some awful results. I mean, it's extraordinary to imagine that very... And I, I remember, you know, even meeting one of these officials in the from the Justice Department uh, in 2002 in Washington. And it was extraordinary to 
listen to this erudite man whose expertise is in Thomas Aquinas, justifying essentially why we need to do this sort of thing to individuals. It was extraordinary. <laughs> it's, it's, but it's, it's, it, it's, it beggars it's, belief, yeah. But that's why, I mean, this is not a new thing, right? This no, is not something not. the United States invented. I mean, no, uh, Thomas Aquinas not. is actually a fantastic example. Thomas Aquinas yes, is the true. bastard who who transformed a peaceful religion, a religion where the leader of the religion, the idol, literally was willing to die on a cross for to make a point that we don't use violence <laughs> and turned <laughs> it 350 later. years later into the just war doctrine in order to help mm -hmm. the, the Roman Empire to justify attacking the heathens and like doing its wars of conquest, right? That's exactly the kind of bastards um, that did this like th thousand yeah. six hundred years ago. Um, absolutely. Yeah, actually, do you yeah, find that, absolutely. Do you find like a the continuation in, in there of is this, a continuation? There is absolutely. I, I quite agree, and I, I think it's it's very apt that you point it out because that that's the. You know, you, you find this consistency in, in these authorities that wherever you, 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 um, you know, thank goodness for the conventions, the international, you know, humanitarian protections and whatnot, and international humanitarian law and whatnot, and the Geneva Conventions, but you do, you do also have this paradoxical thing where, well, yes, there's that, but then there are these, uh, you know, vicious justifications that uh, involve departures and violations. Um, you know, in the context of an ideology. And I think the, the modern U.S. state with the use of terms such as rogue state and, you know, it does enable that sort of thing, you know, to, um, or at least it gives some kind of padding to some appalling uh, behavior in the context of what is done where, okay, we are the law abiders, we are really the ones who created it, but at the same time, there will always be these exceptions and whatnot. And it's, 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 yeah, it is remarkable. <laughs> and it, it brings us back also to this question of whether whether it, uh, um, in the end Thucydides or the Athenians in Thucydides were right, you know, uh, the weak mm -hmm. do, uh, the, the strong do what they want and the weak yeah. suffer what they must. Um, but but the, the, the development of international law, and we had this debate just this week in a conference here, also mm -hmm. shows that there is a strong pushback against this, right? A majority mm. of states does actually not re, uh, not accept some of these norms that waterboarding suddenly is part of of the polite polite society using using ways to circumvent uh, um, treaties on on uh, against uh, uh, torture, and we have mm -hmm. international treaties against torture, so. Do you think the overall, do you see a strengthening of international law or rather a weakening of these norms? Oh, well, that's a very, it's a, it's a very interesting question because the, it's, you know, when I was thinking about the language being used and has been used for, it's become very popular these days. And it's actually not, not fairly recent as a phenomenon. Um, and I suppose it arises because of the emergence of uh, the BRICS powers, the emergence of, um, you know, other countries in response to the, the US-led order. But it is this notion about what is the supposedly the law rules-based society. And, um, and what is interesting is that you, you start realizing that maybe Justice Powell, you know, who I mentioned earlier in the context of the... Um, uh, the tribunal of the Far East, uh, who said that, uh, because he said that there was, there was no such thing as an international community that had these values. You couldn't use the terminology of a global international framework, a law rules order that would govern the waging of war in the same way that you could in other contexts, maybe. Um, and so that raises the interesting thing that the very countries that keep using the terminology of I'm defending these laws are the very countries who will violate it when they want to and so on. So the fact is many countries follow laws. They always do. It's interesting, for example, the laws of the sea are actually complied with by many member states. It's really interesting. And I think what they, it doesn't tend to make the press uh, compliance never tends to make the, the headlines. Non-compliance does. South Sea violations, Chinese aggression, uh, Filipino response, all these things. Um, 
but what is fascinating is that fundamentally when it comes down to it, I think that many states as a general rule do abide by the various regulations. But so I, I would say that yes, there are, there is on a large level, there is a, a following of rules that are connected with certain things. It's patchy with things like human rights because even countries in the West have varying interpretations about that, about how they're implemented and so on. Um, but, but at the same time, though, there is this contest now as to who determines the validity of, uh, you know, what the Germans would call the Grundnorm. What, where does it fit? I mean, it's very hard to identify one in the international space, but I, it is nonetheless important to note that most countries agree that certain things have to be followed, and they do generally. But, but this, I, I would argue that it's very much against the interests of the United States and its allies to start using this, you know, the argument, this is the law-based international order, because let's face it, it was dictated at the end of a gun or the end of a, you know, of a navy or fleet and whatnot. And, and I think this is something that's often forgotten, that it's not a, an objective thing necessarily, but it still has a, a compact of power that justifies it. Yeah, and I must add something I, I confused earlier. Uh, Thomas Aquinas, who you mentioned with St. Augustine. St. Augustine is the one I was oh, yeah, no, Augustine about. is the only one. You know, I, I gathered, I, I did. Sorry, you... sorry about that. Just also to the listeners, I, I confused it. Yeah, yeah, We're yeah. talking about St. No, Augustine. No, I don't want to, to do unjustice to Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> That's um, right. No, the, you have to deal with the man from Hippo. Yes, that's right. Yes. The, the Hippo, <laughs> yes. Um, anyhow, the going back to uh, to the norm, this norm development. It's you know, it was. I had a guest on this show, um, uh, Chas Freeman, a former U.S. ambassador, and he yeah, yeah. made the very, very witty observation that the this this idea that re is really only a few years old right the rules based international order that's yeah. that's that's a new jargon to talk about essentially something that is not international law but that is supposed to sound as if though it was but he mm. made the observation that the rules based international order jargon is actually the opposite of law it's not the <laughs> rule of law it's the rule by law um, because you you abuse the right to to set what the law is um, mm. on a case by case basis, mm. uh, and you never spell out what the rules actually are, through which you then create a dystopian kind of uh, um, system of insecurity, so that that you are the only arbiter of of what actually is supposed to happen, uh, which is the opposite of what the the United States often stands for. Right, um, everybody mm. is bound by the same rules, but we know now that that is definitely not true on the international realm, and we also know that. Uh, uh, Internally too, the the U.S. seems to be quite selective. I mean, the in short, uh, uh, Donald Trump is the first president in the history of the U.S. who to ever to ever be uh, indicted for illegal behavior. Like we are we are asked to believe that for 250 years, not a single president ever broke the law, not one, except for this one. Which then raises the question: Okay. <laughs> Can we can we believe anything that comes out of like um, this law law jargon from from the United States? Is it all um, empty words? Or uh, I mean, I wouldn't say so. I think the idea of of, of yeah. law, international law, and domestic law is a very good one. But um, what should we what should we take serious and whatnot? Uh, well, we have to be discerning. We need to be discriminating. We need to be careful as well, because the United States um, has, uh, you know, again, that, that great paradox of being um, one of the most significant uh, proponents of international norms and rules, producing some of the most magnificent drafting. I mean, they, they are very good drafters when it comes to these things, the role of the drafting, you know, um, admittedly as part of a more cosmopolitan group about the UN Declaration of Human Rights and and these things. But, you know, and also every single, you know, there's not a single international convention covering law um, worth mentioning that doesn't have the hand of the United States in it in some way. But, but that raises the point, though, that domestic politics is a very powerful mechanism here in the United States. The Senate is e enormously powerful. You know, the final chamber that uh, ultimately approves ratification of documents and whatnot. 
And in addition to that, the U.S. being the power that it is will, um, you know, actually depart at certain points. And let's not forget the United States is a very good, um, as it were, comparison or a very good um, emulator, uh, you know, to, to look at, which is the United Kingdom. Let's look at, for example, what happened just very recently with the um, the uh, the so-called deal and the settlement made with the Chagos Islands, where supposedly after this period of time, you know, uh, where, you know, between 1968 and 1973, uh, actually it was a bit early, 1965 to 1973, uh, the Chagos Islanders were expelled from this small archipelago of islands in the, in, in, you know, Indo-Pacific. And, the fundamental basis was to create, essentially for the United States, this, this enormous strategic base called Diego Garcia or the Diego Garcia base. And to see the way the UK Foreign Office used international law was fascinating because what they did was initially it was, well, obviously it was pure power politics and there's some very rude and vulgar remarks in the UK correspondence with their um, US counterparts about remo- you know, removing Tarzans and Mr. Fr- you know, Man Fridays and all that. And once we do that, we will have the islands for you to use, which is exactly what they did. So they got rid of them. They evicted the islanders um, from the context that originally they were under Mauritian control. Um, and the deal that was made recently literally just earlier this month, the announcement was made, was that everything would be returned supposedly to Mauritian control, which is itself problematic. But the island of Diego Garcia would be held for 99 years on lease for the United States to continue its operations from the base. So a lot of mention was made about the gloriousness of international law. But then along with that was the strategic importance of protecting freedom in the Indo-Pacific by keeping this base operational. So, and, and don't forget, there was another very cynical endeavor, you know, for your listeners that I have to mention. The UK uh, f- um, Foreign Office did put together a proposal which was held by the Permanent Court of Arbitration to be uh, a violation of international law uh, and undertakings made by the UK. And that was the declaration around Diego Garcia, the islands there in the um, Indo-Pacific and Chagos. They used, of all things, environmental excuses. They said that this would be a marine protected reserve. International law too. (laughs) It's like, you know, uh, (laughs) these justifications and what you're telling me here. I mean, there's such a huge, big BS written over it that it's it's really it's really hard to see anything else. Uh, Yeah. But but this is how 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 a good part of international the international world works. The the outside justification and the inside uh, intention are completely separate, right? Mm, Which is mm. then what makes it so hard to understand are mm. these norms that we are talking about even meant seriously, or are they themselves just part of a sick joke? Um, if you look at the abuse of the human rights discourse, for instance, mm, mm. human rights are a great idea. It's something we should have. And actually also for everybody out there who thinks um, human rights itself is just all uh, hot air. It's not. I mean, also in Africa and in Asia and in in South America, you have regional courts that developed because local countries want to have those. It's a good idea. But you see then how larger states abuse that discourse in order to put like random pressure on other countries for instance how the united states and even israel have the had the spite to actually while the genocide in gaza was in full swing uh in december last year to actually draft a treaty in another treaty but then an, an, a document at the un level criticizing mm-hmm. Uh, china for human rights abuses against the uyghurs accusing them of genocide Mm, against mm. the Uyghurs and Israel signed on to that. I mean, you, 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 evil Chinese, you are you are uh, genociding uh, innocent uh, Muslims in in your country. It, so it's just the mockery that this makes out of the principles is 
is disgusting and it it then it raises the question if they these these principles are meant seriously or not what is what is your take to that uh, my, my feeling is and and, and uh, i've always been of the of the view that it, it is it is a serious and a very significant change in the the way one appraises um, international law to see the emergence of the human the human subject as a worthy subject of protection a worthy figure of um, shielding from the shall we say the depravities of power and whatnot. However, we are left with this very strange problem. The greatest protectors are the same, are also the greatest violators. The states are the ones who are meant to, are the protectors. They have to be the enforcers and they have to be the ones who sign up to the conventions. They need to be the observers. And then also, ironically enough, they're the ones who are some of the gravest abusers. And that's always been the dilemma of international law, but also specifically with human rights law, um, where as long as there's strong internal institutions in a state, some of these grave aspects can be um, dealt with and moderated somewhat. Unfortunately, generally, of course, you know, there is a lot of unevenness about this, and, and we see that. The existence of it is very fundamental, but there will always be behind it this element of politics You know, I, I'm reminded actually by um, Carl Schmitt's writings uh, on, in, in, in his political theology, where he was very, of course, critical about the League of Nations and these experiments. He did say that if you have international systems that are regulated in this way, the paradox of having an international system like that is that it creates wars, doesn't stop wars. It, it's, you know, because you, you constrain, what you do is you moralize Uh, international relations to the point where there are these um, instances of the outlaws, instances of we are the right ones, these are the outlaws. And it creates a situation where conflict does happen. So that's why he was one of the great critics of the of the League of Nations. I, I don't entirely agree with that, but it's a very interesting analytical way of looking at the way laws work and the way they're used in the international scene. Because when we export them beyond the domestic scene, where we can at least control things in certain ways, um, international states just operate on that other level where they do, certain things are followed, but there are going to be departures. So the best way I think of dealing with international law is trying to find a mechanism by which um, these departures from it can be in, you know, made less vicious, less, less awful as it were, because that's the big problem. Yeah, um, they, but, especially and especially when it comes to the great powers, the big powers, yeah. the ones with the might, and that that is the huge problem. Yeah, yeah, but we can't enforce it. That's the problem, right? The, the yeah, exactly. We can't exactly. enforce domestic law because domestically we have police and judges and so exactly. on, and prisons. In internationally, we don't. the The idea, though, of of, right. of international law, one of the one of the fundamental ideas is that once you ratify a treaty. Um, you that international body of law becomes also domestic law, so it becomes domestically mm. applicable. And we have seen too little of that because, in principle, in theory, once the U.S. ratifies a treaty, it should be possible for U.S. citizens to to uh, drag their governments to court and say, like, "Hey, guys, this Guantanamo business is a horrible infringement on the." on the treaty, uh, on the anti-torture treaty that you signed. So we, the citizens, now demand that you, the government, adhere to that and we will use our courts in order to punish you. But we haven't seen that happening. Why no. Why yeah. not? Um, uh, again, uh, the, yeah, and, and the reason why is that states still, especially the powerful ones, and, and not, let's not forget the same principle as applied to, for example, China, Russia, and a few and other states, India, and so on, um, is that there is this kind of, uh, you know, limitation about, you know, ultimately the notion of domestic jurisdiction being fundamentally the first one. And then, yes, international jurisdictions permitted, but always on various provisos. So, for example, actually, th this is something worth noting, is that many countries who, certainly those who have signed up to the international covenant and civil and political rights and the optional protocol in addition to that their citizens can apply to the you know human rights committee for an address of grievance it doesn't mean though that their ruling is binding okay the HR, but 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 nonetheless i'll 
let's take you know, the Australian example, there have been a couple of very influential, um, shall we say, complaints that have resulted in genuine changes in domestic law. So in Australia, the system is, is an interesting one in, in so far as Australia ratifies a treaty, but it's not automatic incorporation. They need to, Parliament needs to draft a bill and needs to pass it that incorporates the treaty obligations. So, so it's been quite weird. So you'll have a situation where, especially, for example, with refugee law, Australia has a notoriously bad approach. It's got, of course, this unfortunate model that European states love to would like to emulate, which is sending, as it's doing, by the way, the EU is doing this now, sending refugees to third states. Um, so, um, but in the Australian context, uh, the uh, full incorporation is not automatic. You need to address it through legislation in Australia. But there is, however, the Human Rights Committee is an interesting avenue that states have in many countries. So even from European countries as well, even the United States on some level, you can apply to have um, your grievance on a violation of some of the key protections of the convention being violated. In 1994, for example, um, there was a very famous case in Australia called the Tunin case. Tunin uh, is an activist, a very famous um, you know, um, gay rights activist who actually took the case to um, the case about violation of privacy um, to, the, to Geneva, to the Human Rights Committee there. And he argued that uh, Tasmanian law, so the state of Tasmania had an, an, a really an, a, anachronistic law about criminalizing, um, you know, homosexual um, relations, um, you know, um, sexual conduct and whatnot. He was successful. And they said that the state should not be, the, the province of the state here should not be to interfere in the privacy of one's choices when it came to sexual partners and whatnot. Um, but, okay, it wasn't binding, but what the Australian government did, and this is why I have a bit of faith in international law and its functions, the Australian government of the day did say, okay, we know it's not binding, but the federal government passed legislation that changed the state government's law on that in response. So there was a kind of a there was really a feeling that this was a very powerful decision that had been made by the Human Rights Committee. And it actually directly and eventually, albeit a bit a roundabout way, influenced domestic law in a country. Right. So I think so, so there's a kind of a filtering down effect. It, it doesn't it's not immediate, but it takes place over a series of stages. But it, it, it's very evident that it does happen. Well, that, that, that is a good example, but it's also one where you actually have the sovereign kind of in agreement and then pushing yes. it down on the lower That's level, true. right? That's so true. we still depend on the sovereign. And the Absolutely. question to me really is, I mean, if we, we, some, we often think that we are, we are the end of a long, of a long development, mm. right? And we are the pinnacle of like what we have achieved so far because we have iPhones and, and, and almost self-driving cars, right? We are the future, but we are not, right? We are just one stage in a long process and international law is obviously not done. And obviously also the international community is not done. So the, the question is like, if we can add something, what would it be? Because what we are seeing again mm -hmm. now is the, the, mm -hmm. the state, the sovereign overriding the rights of other communities when they do wars and kill like half a million Iraqis just in order to get rid of Saddam because they can, um, right. but also against their own population, right? And the German constitution has this interesting idea of the their their constitution, the the, the basic law actually, as it is called, yeah. of yep, yep, yep. um so so-called Abwehrrechte, so rights to repel or to reject um uh, something that comes from government, from the central government, right? Because the memory of Hitler just suddenly, uh, you know, doing all of this horrible uh, uh, Ill illegal stuff and forcing people to do illegal, uh, like uh, like highly immoral stuff mm. under the mm. guise of this being a law. Um, and human rights, in a sense, are similar to that, that, that there's the, this idea that, certain, that at certain points, the individuals have the right to say no to their own governments and say, like, even if you make a law, 
this is not binding on me because you're actually breaching use Kogan's, you're breaching also the 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 the, the rights Absolutely. of the individual. Can in your view, can that mechanism be 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 increased or strengthened so that that um the sovereign loses loses a bit of the this 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 draconic power it actually has? I think it's a very important point you make because the you know, th this idea of the absolute sovereign is fundamental in, in numerous jurisdictions and legal theory. I mean, we have, um, you know, A.V. Dicey, the, the English constitutional lawyer, famously said that the only thing uh, the British Parliament can do was to turn a man into a woman and a woman to the man. Obviously, they can now, but anyway, but that's another story. But, 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 but it is interesting that the sheer absolutist nature of it, um, I that there should always be some means of curtailing it, controlling it, fettering it, and so on because I think it's, that's precisely what's needed. Um, and the notion you just mentioned about responding, about one's, um, you know, as it were, there are certain obligations we have that transcend the state, that transcend it. I mean, to me, you know, international law is traditionally, of course, it's been the law of states. But when you break it down, it's now the law of subjects as well. It's individual choices we make on the battlefield and in war, and, uh, you know, it, it, when it comes to humanitarian law, when it comes to human rights, I, I think it's important to raise this because I think it's a very neat and, and disturbing illustration on your point. Uh, there was a case recently, um, which is significant in Australian law that happened, which has international echoes, as it were. Um, and that was a whistleblower by the name of uh, David McBride, David McBride was a former military lawyer for the Australian army. He, uh, he served uh, in Afghanistan for a couple of tours with the Australian forces. And over time, he accumulated a dossier of uh, essentially really gruesome, well, I mean, there's no such thing as not gruesome war crimes, but it was a series of uh, documents that revealed atrocities committed by Australian special forces in the field in Afghanistan. And the Australian forces, uh, for me, listeners, you know, your listeners are not familiar, they, even US special forces thought they were a bit gung-ho. Imagine that. They said that some of these characters would go into villages and and engage in the, the kind of behavior that would be, you know, would, would make any international lawyer squirm. The point about McBride's disclosures, they ended up being published by the Australian national broadcaster, the ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. It became a, a, a very important document. It's a landmark series of documents uh, alleging Australian misconduct and, and, and criminality in war, um, violation of not just Australian law, international laws, a range of other provisions. He have, He's now serving prison and he's now appealing the case. In this trial, there was a very interesting thing that was raised by his defense lawyers. Well, his defense lawyers said that he was transcending his duty, I mean, the oath of loyalty to the sovereign by disclosing the material. The prosecution said that the anyone in the army has an absolute duty to follow and discharge duties under the oath. You're not meant to think, in other words, about the regulations in that way. It was an extraordinary case. It, it, it also, when I read the details of the case, it took me, I felt I was in a time warp because, and I think countries do this too, you know, the legal professions and whatnot, they, they, they do tend to ignore sometimes that there was such a thing as Nuremberg. There was such a thing as the military tribunal. There was such a thing that there is a conscientious objection argument to be made. There is something that at points we need to disobey the law. We need to breach the oath because if we are told to do certain things, when we observe what we do, what we participate in, we must breach it at points because I tell you what, in an international, certainly under the Rome Charter and the Rome Statute for the ICC, the International Criminal Court. Okay, I mean, okay, so you, you, you followed the sovereign order but that resulted in a war crime. And, uh, and it's interesting that in Australian law, as an example, that didn't seem to filter through to the military aspect. It was extraordinary. None of the prosecutors ever mentioned the Rome Statute. None of them ever mentioned Nuremberg. And they, they even implied that that aspect of it didn't apply at all, which is nonsense. It does. Now it's being litigated. It's being taken on appeal. So that will be a really interesting thing to see what happens there.
It's just, you know, uh, we, we would want that to be the case, right? We would want yeah. to have the norm that the soldier and the, 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 the civil servant actually has to have the good of the community at heart and not the, not the success of the policy of the, uh, of the ruler. Um, I mean, this creates horrible, this creates contradictions that are really difficult to, to sure. reconcile, but yeah. we, because we see this, I mean, there was also this, uh, this very famous case in Germany after mm -hmm. the, the wall came down and, and West Germany swallowed up East Germany. And then yeah. the, uh, West German now, uh, federal, the, the federal, uh, prosecution then yeah. prosecuted, um, soldiers in East Germany former East Germany who shot and killed yeah, the uh, water guns. Actors. Yes, that's right. Yeah, and that's right. Yeah, they, yeah. they, the problem, of course, that the East German soldiers, they were acting according to the law and they were doing yes. their duty to the state, exactly. to East German state. But then uh, after West Germany won, it argued that, oh, no, 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 um, higher moral law. You should have known that what you're doing is uh, is a crime against the German nation, and therefore it's null and void, and you should have you should have refused to shoot. And they they sent people to prison for many many years. Um, well, those were infamous. No, I, I remember following that closely. It was extraordinary to see also as a kind of a conceptual thing too. Precisely, yeah, uh, border guards shooting people across. Yeah, yeah that's right. The, it's just the for for practical reasons. What we are left with is that in twenty twenty four. Um, you know, if we say it, if we if we go if we formulated a little bit, uh, uh, um, I mean, a little bit crass is that the only war crime that gets you hung from the neck is losing a war. But as yes. long as you don't lose, as long as you survive, you will be part of the of the next ruling regime, and you will be uh, you will be well protected, right, from any kind of uh, any kind yeah, of harm. And, and so the question that... is, how do we change that? Yeah, and that's that's precisely a very good point. How do we change it without creating a problem in and of itself? So, for example, one of the arguments that has been made is uh, strengthening world institutions. You know, you you bring you add more teeth to them. Uh, for example, you know, there's been this long argument, as I know you, you you'll be familiar with, about um, the UN and what it does. Not not just having peacekeeping forces, but an actual viable army. Uh, you know, policing those things, that's problematic, uh, raises problem. issues. Uh, yeah, you know, very. Um, there are issues about um, how we, you know, uh, deal with enforcement mechanisms across uh, conventions and so on. I actually, I, I'm, I'm going to be a bit more upbeat about this and say that actually, generally speaking, there are some horrendous violations that happen. And they do happen across the board, but I would also say that actually, interestingly enough, in international law is abided by in many instances on a daily basis. True. And I would say, and I would say that that's a positive thing to remember that that there is this this understanding. You know, the the law of comity. There is an understanding that states will follow things and accept that. Um, you know that that certain conventions will still apply. It is true, though, whenever there is a power equation. And when there is the issue of one's own citizens, the government's, uh, you know, uh, worried about, for example, their soldiers being tried, the, the, the arguments about Henry Kissinger against the International Criminal Court saying that uh, this is a kind of tyranny because, well, the U.S. obviously does it better. We don't want to have this foreign court determining the guilt of our soldiers and personnel. Uh, but but a lot of this is also yeah. There's a bit of nonsense as well because generally speaking, uh, many countries tend to abide by these things. But the it is very hard to divorce the equation of power from the practice of certain aspects of international law. So, you know, my my sympathy has to go out. For example, to I know, for example, the prosecutor Mr. Karim is in trouble for the ICC at the moment for allegations that have been made uh, in his connection with uh, with his office um, you know misconduct uh, matters and so on I have to look at the details but but I'm not I, I'm gonna have a little guess here that and, and admittedly it's not an educated guess it's just an instinct instinctual guess that when a person gets committed to these things overly in terms of the law system you do get into trouble because uh, you know you you do end up having to be either removed or 
<laughs> something happens. And I, I believe uh, that there are individuals who are very much part of the, uh, shall we say, the, the side of enforcing it, but it is a very fragile beast. Um, but many countries still do try to do, you know, fairly good about these sorts of things. You know, um, it, it just came to me thinking about it. So, for example, the notion of universal jurisdiction and matters. I mean, you know, uh, Mr. Netanyahu would be very careful. And I would suggest to him directly if he was listening to us, and I hope he listens to our podcast or the podcast, you know, that uh, he'd be very advised not to travel to many countries because under certain aspects of, you know, you know EU's universal jurisdiction matters, he is perfectly legitimately to be arrested. It doesn't have to have an ICC warrant. You don't need an ICC warrant. You can be arrested under the local jurisdiction of a country because you've committed war crimes elsewhere. Maybe that's a way forward, you know, the, the more local jurisdictions, because I'm afraid mm. of all of these designs that create more like centralization <laughs> yes. on top because they're really that. easy to subvert and then and then abuse. And we are seeing that with the European Union, that 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 sad, sad tragedy of a, of a, of, a, of a good idea. But but the um but the decentralized decentralized mechanisms to just sure. increase pressure on foreign dignitaries so that at some point you they they start self constraining um especially if we think about the the future of the, of the next 20 30 40 years being a multipolar one and not a unipolar one where everything depends on different on different regional actors I think, yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think the, and back to the point, and, and you know, it's a very nice way to, for me to bring in the man I mentioned before, the critic of the ICC, who faced a couple of domestic legal uh, lawsuits. And, and one of them, uh, one, one was in Britain. It didn't go anywhere because the judge simply said that it wasn't feasible, given the fact that, that the man wasn't in the jurisdiction, the man being, uh, you know, Henry Kissinger. Um, you know, um, but there was one, um, I, I do remember uh, the late Christopher Hitchens, you know, the, the, the writer Christopher Hitchens, uh, you know, did say that uh, because he wrote this book, of course, about the essentially about the war crimes of Henry Kissinger. Um, and in, in what is interesting is that Kissinger did spend, there was this stint when he was in Paris and there was in fact a, a, a legal so one of the judicial officers had, in fact, filed paperwork trying to not necessarily charge him for war crimes, but to ask him questions in connection specifically with uh, Operation Condor uh, in the connection with uh, the killings and the torture arising from the U.S.-backed operations in the Cold War in Latin America, especially in Argentina and, and Chile and so on. And um, he, he left very quickly and he never visited that particular part of the world again. And I think it's, it's, it is still worth noting that local jurisdictional matters, there is, there is a proviso in many countries about that. And I think building that up and enforcing that and letting citizens know about that too. I think most, most citizens would not be aware about the notion uh, of, say, a citizen's arrest or, you know, when you, when you see an individual um, you know, uh, a notorious figure who might be a war criminal or whatnot. There is provision in many jurisdictions in the world for that sort of thing. So I, I think it's, yeah, it's worth thinking about that. If you return it to um, local communities understanding uh, where international law fits, and I think one of the tasks, one of my tasks in my uh, lecturing um, as I regarded my lecturing burden but pleasure as well it's a burden with pleasure is to try to explain to students the interrelationship with international law and domestic jurisdiction it's that essentially what we're discussing today and to let students know where they link the two yeah. this you know the universal declaration of human rights is not just an abstract thing the international convention of human rights uh, the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, the range of these international instruments are not abstract. You know, they, they, they are very much part of the living fabric of a legal society. And I keep thinking that, you know, we have, we have examples of working international law um, that is enforceable. And the, the mm. one thing that comes to my mind is from the 
the, the economic realm from our, um, arbitration. We have the, the Washington okay. declar not declaration, the Washington uh, Treaty, which mm -hmm. allows arbitration awards to be enforced yeah. in yeah. every single member state. And these arbitration awards are, uh, you know, the, the 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 legal the legal systems then follow that. This is a very yeah. very powerful instrument, and you don't mm -hmm. need a supranational organization. You just need an agreement that uh, among the different That's... jurisdictions that you implement uh, a, a certain decision. Um, could something like the Washington Treaty be repeated for, let's say, human rights abuses, like if that that um, the human rights court could make a decision and then give an, give an, give an award, and then that would have to be implemented um, against individuals, let's say, and and state yeah. actors, not necessarily in the abstract realm where you would require change of uh, domestic domestic legislation. Yeah, no, no, I, I think it's on, on a certain level, I think that would be feasible. Um, well, in, in, a, in a sense, you can already see that, although it's still based on the the, the notion of of comity, you know, acknowledgement from from states. But that is the Thanks. when you know uh, legal actions are, are sought about compensation for, for example, acts of terrorism or whatever it might be. So, for example, the Lockerbie bombing is an example, and then you know, but it it's still based on on you know the consent of a state to pay compensation to a particular fund or whatever. But but something of, as a kind of an arb arbitral award on that would be really interesting and something that fits into it. You know, I mean, let, let's let's remember and let's not be too disheartened on some level that that you know redress of things do happen um, for grave abuses. So, for example, um, the uh, I'm just thinking of the uh, instance in 2004. The the Australian uh, the Australian Foreign Intelligence Service, ASIS, the, the Secret Intelligence Services, bugged. Uh, it's, it's, it's one of the most uh, notorious and outrageous things, but it, it really was really typical of the kind of the atmosphere at the time. But ASIS, uh, the Australian Secret Intelligence Services, bugged the diplomatic offices of the East Timorese delegation as they were negotiating oil and gas rights to the Timor Sea. Um, this also actually has a connection with violations of law and whistleblowers and whatnot, because uh, there was an agent in the Australian services that disclosed that this happened publicly, eventually. Information was then revealed. It ended up going to the, uh, the, the Court of Arbitration, Permanent Court of Arbitration. And yes, Australia and East Timor ended up renegotiating the original treaty, which was so grossly in favour of Australia regarding one of the most impoverished countries on the planet. And of course, a new country, remember, um, after having been under Indonesian occupation for so long. Um, and that was an example of an international system that, albeit imperfect, functions on some level, because there is people still negotiate, people still turn up, people try to reach things, even though the situation is a bit grim in the background. I think this is a this is a good notion to to kind of wrap it up. Um, Binoy, where can people find your writings? Do you publish somewhere? Are you on yes, absolutely. So so yes, uh, thank you, Pascal. So I mean, I I write regularly for the um, um, the magazine known as Counterpunch. So I'm a contributing editor to Counterpunch, and so you'll you'll be able to find my writings there. I write for a range of others, you know, Global Research uh, as well, and a few others, but Counterpunch is sort of the, the home aspect. I do also do writing for Middle East Monitor as well regarding, uh, you know, Middle Eastern matters, you know, the Israel-Palestinian issue. Um, and um, yeah, and um, you will find me also at, uh, at B. Kampmark on, on uh, you know, Twitter, the Twitter handle and whatnot. But uh, but yes, um, yeah, very happy to uh, receive any discussion points from your wonderful listeners. <laughs> the the links will be in the uh, in the description below. Everybody, um, please follow Binoy Kampmark. Binoy, thank you very much for today. Thank you, Pascal. Anytime. <laughs>